We're at the point in Kant of discussing what is the categorical imperative, and in the last video lectures, I discussed the universal law formulation, and in this set of lectures, I will go over the ends in themselves formulation. So this formulation reads, so act as to treat humanity, whether in thine own person or in that of any other, in every case as an end, withal never as a means only. Put in a little bit more uh, standard English, this is always treat other rational beings. Um, so he says humanity here, but by humanity, he's really emphasizing the rational agent part of human existence, okay? So he says, so act as to treat rational agency, um, whether in your own person or any other person, as, a, as an end in itself and not merely as a means, okay? Uh, once again, trying once again to put it a little bit more clearly, it's always treat rational agents or people um, as uh, ends in themselves and not ever just as a means to an end. And so now let me give you an example that will help to clarify what that means. So imagine a person going into the local coffee shop for their morning coffee and uh, they're kind of in a rush. They're looking forward to their, um, the meetings that they have that morning. And so they kind of are searching through their cell phone and they bark out their order to the barista. And then a few minutes later they say, why is it taking so long? I ordered this five minutes ago uh, and, and so on. Um, they basically in that case would be treating the barista just as a, the person serving them their coffee as a, means to their end, that is the, or the uh, customer's end. They're just treating this person basically like a machine who produces coffee for them. They're not treating that uh, person who's serving them their coffee as a full human being in themselves. That is someone who has their own ends or aims that they are trying to achieve in their life. As someone who is intrinsically valuable, no more or less valuable than the person who's ordering the coffee. And so this idea of a distinction between treating people as means only versus treating people as ends in themselves is basically that kind of distinction. So um, someone who treated the barista as a end in themselves would maybe pay attention to how the barista is feeling about the interaction, how they may be feeling about their day. The person may even ask them, how are you doing today? And actually listen to their reply. And uh, they um, just in general recognizes that the person behind the counter is someone who has a full and complete life and aims of their own and so on that are no more or less valuable than that of the person who's ordering the coffee. Now, it's worth noting here that the person ordering the coffee is, in the second case, who's being, um, who's, who's recognizing the barista as an end in themselves, is also treating the barista as a means to an end. And so Kant is not saying never treat people as means to an end at all, but he's saying don't ever treat people as only a means. Always also recognize in your interactions with people and in, for instance, policy, you know, government policy regarding people, always recognize that people have their own intrinsic value and that they have as much of a right to decide what they do with their lives and what's important to them and what they're going to pursue and try to pursue it as you do to make those decisions in your own life. So Kant gives an argument as to why uh, morality requires this in the last part of the second section, the text that was assigned. And you can look there for that argument. And also there's more information about exactly what he means by this. Um, I think for now, I will just very, very briefly give a gesture at the style of argument that he makes, but I won't try to um, accurately summarize it in any detail. So the basic argument is this. There are two kinds of beings, as Kant calls them, are two kinds of 
um, existences, types of uh, stuff that exists in the, in the world. One of those types of beings is what he calls things, and the other types of being is what he calls persons. So the difference, or the, the crucial difference between these for the purposes of this argument is that things only have value relative to some valuer or some action of valuing. Things themselves aren't intrinsically valuable. They're just valuable because they serve some end or they end up uh, being themselves the object of desire or valuation by something that can pursue them. Persons, on the other hand, are things that, uh, that, that generate or um, produce distinctions of value by their valuing. So persons are things that set ends. They're the types of beings that, that aim for things, that, that choose things or that value things. And so in a way, persons are the source of value in the universe. They're the type of entity or being that is the origins of value itself and distinctions of value. Okay. So the next point to make after we have that distinction between things and persons is that no person is more a generator of values or more legitimately a generator of values than another. So if, if I'm a person and you're a person, then the values that we are generating or aiming for are of equivalent value because no neither one of us is a privileged valuer or has a privileged opinion about or privileged um, uh, privileged status as far as the things that we uh, are aiming for or what our ends are. So because persons are the sources of value, they're more valuable than any particular thing that's desired. And because no one person's desires are more valuable than another's. All of our desires are of equivalent value as desires, or I should put it this way, not just in terms of desire, but in terms of ends or the things pursued or aimed for. Hum um, persons, by generating these ends, uh, are of equivalent value with one another, okay? And they have a higher value than the value of things since they are the, themselves the sources of value. Now, if these two things are the case, then we already have a, an obligation, or it should be clear why we have an obligation to recognize other persons as ends in themselves and not just as means. When we treat uh, people just as means, it's like we're treating them as things rather than as persons, which is what they actually are. Um, one more point that needs to be made here is that persons are beings that reason, that make decisions on the basis of reason, that they are what Kant elsewhere calls rational agents. And Kant even recognizes that if there are aliens on other planets or if there are non-human animals that are capable of reasoning, those uh, beings will be counted as rational agents as well. And morality will apply to them. So this, um, both this formulation and the other formulation of the categorical imperative are ones that we need to apply to, uh, to all rational agents and also ones that would apply to their behavior and that, they, that the behavior of those um, agents, alien, rational aliens or rational non-human animals, that those um, beings should also follow the same moral principles, uh, believe it or not. Uh, because for Kant, morality is really grounded in or rooted in rationality. It's not rooted, rooted in our human nature. It's rather rooted in our, um, our status as rational. And that's what makes us, again, persons. Uh, and that's the thing that we have a responsibility to respect here in this ends in themselves formulation. Uh, the one last point that I want to make, though, okay, sorry, that was all kind of a way to getting to this last point, is that uh, that these persons, even though they are the setters of value, they're the ones that that 
um, are value generators. They generate the distinction between uh, that more and less valuable. They're the ones who have ends and thereby have this themselves higher value uh, than mere things because they are the generators of, um, of, of, of ends. Even though that's true, they're still under the constraint of morality because um, the ends that they pursue have to be ones if they're themselves in order, if they are themselves going to be able to recognize the rational agency of other persons, then the ends that they pursue must be ends that satisfy the categorical imperative. In other words, they have to themselves in their valuing not value and not pursue ends in such a way that they violate the categorical imperative. So all rational agents both deserve a certain respect from other rational agents, but they also are under certain obligations just by virtue of being rational agents. They're, they're under certain constraints, their will is, or else they will themselves be behaving immorally. Okay, so I think that's enough for now. That's uh, a lot of dense philosophy this week from Kant, and you also have an exam to take. So I will stop here and we will do some more work on Kant as well as utilitarianism, just a little bit to touch up and finish up this unit next week. So next week, week seven, we'll actually finish up the unit on uh, ethical theories and we'll move from that point forward into the new unit, the, the second main unit of the course. See you then.